And then boom, just like that, arguably the biggest superstar we've ever had on the show, Lauren Healy on the line. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good. Thanks, Adam. I'm, you know, it's been a been a wild ride, but I'm just like anybody who's listening to this show. I've been wheeling my whole life and just got lucky to turn it into my career. Yeah, absolutely. And let me be the first to wish an early uh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody that's traveling or doing anything like that. I hope that everything goes smooth and safe. And uh, we're here to hear about the man himself. Uh, but before we jump into the show, uh, how have you been during the strange virus times that we've had? It's been a crazy year. Yeah, 2020 has been insane. Uh, you know, really, we had to figure out right away, right after King of Hammers, we got home and went to Alaska. And, uh, you know, um, COVID hit while I was in Alaska. And then I, then I started, you know, paying attention to it. Wasn't sure if I was going to get to come home. And as soon as I got home, we had to start figuring out how to how to make a plan to to get through this year. And you know, luckily, uh, you know, Von Gittin Jr. and I had teamed up last year, formed the Fun Hammer Off Road team. Yeah. And and we had a lot of resources, you know, to go create content and and talk to our partners and really figure out how to come up with a game plan on on making this year you know successful. And and luckily, it's been a great year for us. All of our partners are very happy. Everybody wants to see more of what we're doing and, you know, keep keep growing the program. So even though racing's a little weird, you know, the activation events, the shows, the SEMA, the off-road expos, that stuff, you know, we've, we've just pivoted sideways and, and be able to uh, make the right changes. So let me ask you, just jumping right into it. I know that you have, you know, recently you have the Fun Haver truck. You obviously have your 4,400 car. Um, but even so recently, you have this uh, Fun Haver little like trail rig that you've been bouncing around in on the weekends. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Because I've seen it and it's like short wheelbase, just tons of power. And it is crazy, crazy fun, it looks like. Yeah, man, we, we just finished that thing uh, about two weeks ago. And uh, I don't know if you knew who Kevin Carroll was, but he he was a friend of mine, lived in Moab. To me, he was really the leader in, in the resurgent of hardcore rear steer, yeah. uh, you know, crazy West Coast rock crawler. And mm -hmm. he built the Red Dot cars. He had it built exactly how he wanted. And, you know, he passed away about a year, year plus now. Um, and I was able to get my hands on one of his very last chassis that he built. Uh, Gerald, Gerald Lee with Savvy Off Road had it hiding in his attic up in the up in the rafters, and, <laughs> and so I, I kept bugging him, like, "Hey, man, I want that chassis." And I'd send him a message on Facebook every couple of weeks. Yeah. I, you know, I, I wanted to do something new, um, and had had some parts laying around the shop that were left over from race cars, and and that's kind of how my projects usually start. There, there's there's a motor sitting in the corner of the shop that needs a whole vehicle built around it. Yeah. And that's how it went. we had a uh, we had that 427 out of Bond's race truck that's been sitting in the corner of the shop for like two years, just wow. staring at us every time we walked by. And so uh, it, it, it project came together. Tom at Spider Track said, you know, I've been dying to build these crazy new axles that you know steer 50 degrees and have all this you know crazy strength based on the F450 550 stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with these big 45 spline. Uh, axle shafts and just I mean it's it's crazy it's super cool stuff and so the project just came together and and uh, I always need something to go do dumb stuff in so that's yeah yeah so just to kind of like leapfrog a little bit um, how often you do you normally get to trail ride it seems like you're doing a lot more of that recently than you have in the past few years at least yeah thanks to COVID uh, it's made that opportunity <laughs> where yeah creating creating social media content seems to be what a lot of people who follow my social want to see you know they they get tired of me talking about race cars or talking about other stuff but when i'm posting the trail riding stuff they absolutely love it and it goes it goes crazy so um thanks to COVID, i've i've got to spend you know almost every weekend out wheeling when we're uh when we're not racing yeah so let me know where are you based out of uh where's your shop where is your operations out of so I'm in Farmington, New Mexico, which was kind of a little bit of the birthplace of rock crawling, you know, in the, in the 90s. And that's what really influenced my life a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, Walker Evan, Shannon Campbell, all those guys were rock crawling here competing when I was in high school. And so we'd come out and we'd watch him compete. And, you know, we, we, uh, we you know, kind of inspired my life. That, that was something that, that I wanted to do. And I never really wanted to do it competitively. The, the cone dodging stuff wasn't exactly my cup of tea, but... I really loved going out and watching them. And then we would try to go do the, the same stuff in our trail jump. 
know, we go yeah. out after after they were done competing and and try to run the same lines and you know me and a group of my buddies. So that's yeah. that's what started it and molded my life and and kind of what uh, what pushed me down this path. So did you get into off roading before that? Did a lot of guys you know who race competitively they start in motocross or ATVs and they kind of make that shift over? Were you just a trail guy that just progressed down the pipeline? I was zero racing experience, but, you know, showed up at KOH after Dave Cole had came to, uh, to Farmington for a competition. This was about 2008 and, uh, me and my co-driver that went out with, uh, to King of the Hammers with me the first time, Rodney, we, uh, we were sick of buying, uh, red label crawlers from all the comp guys cause they were sticking <laughs> it to us. So we knew if we showed up at one competition, we could yeah. show a comp number and then we could get on the driver list to be able to buy sticky tires well as fate had it dave cole was there competing and we started bsing with him and had a beer with him and and uh he told us you know what he was doing with king of the hammers and he's like this is exactly what you guys are doing on the weekends every weekend you need to come do it and we're like yeah not no we just want a, a a comp number so that we can buy red labels like that's the only reason we're here and uh we got talking more about it and decided we were going to go out to koh in 2009 Put together like a super budget just old broken trail rig and and uh went out there was completely hooked i mean we broke that car in half in like 10 miles <laughs> shocks blown apart rodney and i had blown through the seats oh, and, God. Uh, and we're sitting on top of the exhaust and our seats caught on fire we had fire rolling up in the cab oh my gosh fuel lock issues stumbled into the pits tranny dropped it blew up the transmission output shaft with you know i mean and this was all within like 10, 15 miles of, oh of, the first of 2009's KOH. But man, I was, I was hooked. I loved it. I, I wanted to be a race car driver and uh, went home, talked my wife into a second mortgage on my house and uh, <laughs> talked to Randy at Jimmy's four by four. And we came up with a super budget, you know, real race car and then showed up at KOH in 10 and won it. Dude, that's amazing. So I want to roll it back. Cause you mentioned something that is, is new to me. Uh, red labels, the sticky competition tire, you used to have to have a like competitor ID to buy those tires. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, it, it was, it was the only way, uh, in that era was to buy them from somebody who was competing. And wow. so we, we didn't know the prices they were paying, but we were getting stuck to us for these like clapped out cracks, junk red labels for like 500 bucks a piece. <laughs> yeah. And and we were so sick of it, and and we had found out that the competitors were paying like three hundred bucks a piece for them, so for brand new ones. So we're like, all right, we'll go get a comp number. All we got to do is, is show that we ran a competition, get the number, and then you can buy them from Jackson Dawson that way. That's so interesting. Now, is there any system like that in place now? I know that there's you know K spec tires, there's still red labels, all those different versions, or have all the tire companies for the most part gone to commercial sales and all those tires? Um, Nitto, or I'm sorry, Maxis and BFG will allow you to buy the tires through commercial venues right now. Nitto still will not. Um, I don't know about any of the other sticky tires. I know it's like some of the balancer tires and that stuff's readily available, mm -hmm. but Nitto still keeps um, uh, race tires only and does not want them sold to the general public in fear of them ending up on the highway and, you know, getting driv driven on a, on a street vehicle. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, it's so funny you say that. I know, um, Mel Wade and his crew that does the off-road evolution, uh, like the the dirt experience, I think is what they're calling it this year. They run or ran in the past, they ran all those K-Spec tires. They would, you know, everybody would get a set and they ran them on the highway. I always wondered a lot. There was a lot of head scratching around how that worked. And, and you know, and that's, I mean, for those who don't know, that's not a street legal tire, you know, and when it really comes down to it. So was there ever any talk about that or was there ever any issues because of that? And, and they are a DOT rated tire. I mean, there's nothing's going to happen on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, to be honest, those of us like Mel and myself that have signed our lives away to Nitto and, you know, they, <laughs> they have us, you know, they have us wrapped up. So we, right. there, there won't be a problem if, uh, if something ever happened, but, yeah. um, you know, they, the tires run fine on the streets. I've got them on my Ranger. I run them on my Jeeps. I, you know, I, I run them on everything. So they, they work fine on the streets. It's just, it's just a uh, super soft, sticky compound, not meant for the streets. Exactly. And that's more along the lines of what I was getting at is it's, it's not the ideal situation where, you know, the, I think the, the point is 
you know, you don't want to sell those off to someone expecting those tire to have the same longevity as a different tire. And then when they, you know, or incidentally buy those red, you know, the case specs and they wear out in 2000 miles, people wouldn't necessarily understand, you know, yep. they'd be in a high performance tire. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So that's really awesome though, that, uh, you got into it just to kind of get those tires and then you get hooked being competitive at the, at the first year or the 2008 King of hammers, um, or King of the hammers, excuse me. Uh, you know, what, what was the next like jump where you have this Jimmy's car, you go out, you win it in 2010. What, what was the difference there? Because you don't just go from trail rider and now I have a, you know, now I have a well-equipped car to winning that race. It's not that easy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so one King of the Hammers, you know, I think I won $15,000 or something that year. Yeah. Um, and that's when the first, first sponsor started to call, uh, Chris Anderson, with ATX wheels at that point had called and said, Hey, you know, we'd like to give you a few traveling bucks and uh, would like to see you out racing some more. And, and I was working full time in the oil field, you know, didn't have much time to do this, but it, and now looking back, I mean, it was, it was like $5,000 probably didn't even cover going to one race, but, yeah. but I was so excited to, to have a partner call and, and want to promote me and wanted to start growing. And, it just, it really took off. So, so that year we ended up winning one of the championships, um, was kind of a crazy year, but like, we went out and won like three or four races back to back to back right there mm -hmm. without even prepping the racetrack. So, I mean, we come home, wash it off, you know, maybe change the oil on it and go for the next race. It's like, it's just, it's insane compared to what we do now on how the race trucks get torn down, you yeah. know, almost to the chassis, almost every single race. And, uh, but, but it just, it kind of set that off. So, you know, we, uh, we took it more serious in, and 2011 and 2011 was definitely a growing pain year. So that was the year I had to figure out that sponsorship is not free and you never take a part or any type of sponsorship that is not going to give you a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. So the off season of 2010 I had people approaching me because we had won the championship at that point. And I had a bunch of people, Axel Parr, stuff like that, calling me and saying, hey, we want you to run our parts. And I'm like, yeah, buddy, send me your stuff. Send me your stuff. I want to run your stuff. But I had to find out the really hard way that that at that point, you're just a test dummy. And they're, they're wanting you to test their products. And it caused me failure after failure after failure all year of 2011. Every race a sponsored part that I had taken took me out of the race. Mm. Mm. So it, it was a huge <laughs> learning. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was yeah. a hurt, huge learning process for me. And that's something I always try to, you know, I get asked all the time on how to do this or, or, you know, how I've gone through this. And, and that's one of the things that I always tell them is, is make sure you believe in your sponsor's products. If you're, if you're pushing these partners products, mm -hmm. you, you better believe in them because it's just going to backfire on you if you don't. Now, let me ask you this. If you are, you know, someone who is, you know, doing well, uh, for example, you win, you win a couple ultra four races or you win, you know, a couple series races and you're really needing, you know, if you need a part or you can use the support to kind of allocate funds somewhere else. Is there ever a scenario where you'd be like, eh, maybe I, maybe we can squeeze it here and really see what happens. And, and or, or is it just like a, you know, if it's going to, cause you any issues at all, it's not worth it. Is there any ROI on like maybe going halfway in there? Man, I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I've been there. I mean, it was, it's do you run this this gear set one more race to, to get it, you know, to get through to the next race or, mm -hmm. and, and that's some stuff that, that you have to figure out budget wise. And it's stuff we even, we, we deal with now. And I'm, I know people think we have an unlimited budget, but it's, it's not, we have to run this like a business and, yeah. and we constantly are evaluating and assessing those situations. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely, uh, you got to figure out what that fine line is of finishing races. Cause that's, that's what you got to do first, get to the finish line and then see, see where the cards fall. That's true. That's true. Okay. So in 2011, you have this learning process. When would you say was your next big jump where the machine was together, you were together, the program was together and you made the next step because you, you really went from like, you know, well-known name to superstar at some point. And I want to try to figure out at what point you think you made that leap. So 2011, I learned all year till the very last race on 
don't take free parts you can't believe it at the end of 2011 the very last race um i had broken another part that had taken me out of another race and i was so frustrated and i called tom at spider tracks and tom is he is one of my favorite people in the world he builds amazing products and has supported me since that day and i told him i'm like i will i will pay for your product i'm not asking for anything free mm -hmm. I just have to, it's so frustrating not finishing these races. It makes me want to quit. I, I don't want to do this anymore because I keep, you know, it keeps taking me out. And so we put a set of spider tracks axles and fixed some brake stuff and some steering stuff and some other stuff that I've been fighting all, all at once in this one little downtime and came back and won Glen Helen that year for, for, you know, right at the end of the year. And it kind of revived my excitement on, on racing again. So you know, it it was kind of one of those learn that was the end to learning 2011 of, of partnering with people that that you really believe in and you know build the best products mm -hmm. and that you want to support and that and that you will go buy their product whether they're going to support you or not. And yeah. so going into 2012, that was when I lost BFG, and it was kind of crazy timing, but right there at the end of the year. Um, BFG decided they were going to take all their marketing dollars and they were going to go give them all to Sean White, the snowboarder. And so all of us off-roaders had to make the decision. Are we are we going to lose lose our dollars, our traveling dollars, our budget that, you know, we can't go race without that money. They they still were going to offer tire support, but um, it just, it, it they just pulled out and, and left all of the off-road community hanging for the most part. And timing just was perfect. That's when Nitto came to the table. They had came to KOH in 2011, but 2012 they came in with the K-Spec and picked up a bunch of us drivers, myself, Nick Nelson, Derek West, you know, a bunch of, uh, I think Eric Miller and Jason Shear got picked up that year. And they brought this whole campaign and they did so much research on that K-Spec on how to make it the toughest tire specifically for King of the Hammer, specifically yeah. for Ultra 4. You know, and and they they've been one of those partners as well, just just like Spider Tracks that has supported us through thick and thin. You know, that have just really really helped move our program on and, and put us where we're at. So, you know that that was a that was a big one. Um, ended up, I think I finished fifth at KOH that year. I think I won a couple another race or two through that season. But I was starting to lose to Shannon in his IFS cars. Mm -hmm. um, just couldn't drive that solid ass car fast enough. And so 2013 is when I started wanting an IFS car. And that was that was probably the next big development in my life was was spending the budget. You know, we went from building like a fifty thousand dollar car to maybe a hundred and fifty, hundred and seventy five thousand dollar independent machine with sort of a real race motor and and things were kind of escalating through Ultra Four as the progression, you know, progressed uh, into the newer technology of the race vehicles. Mm -hmm. So 2013 was another rough year of figuring out where you have to spend your money. Mm -hmm. um, God bless Randy Rod and, and love the man to death at Jimmy's, but he had been building our transmissions for years as we stepped up to a bigger horsepower number. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we started breaking the six, 650 horsepower, mm -hmm. um, we just couldn't keep transmissions alive. So at KOH, we changed my transmission six times. <laughs> Woo! So you have six different transmissions or was it the same transmission getting gutted all, all of it different transmissions wow. swapping parts between two transmissions i mean and and it, it was another one of those i look back on my career that was another one of those moments where i'm like i don't want to do this anymore like yeah. i'm gonna go back to my oil field job sit in my company truck and collect my money and be done with this crap <laughs> yeah i i absolutely understand that so yep. You, you you have those transmission issues. You have you get all these these this IFS car set up. Was it just the learning of the new technology? Because about that 2012 13 era, IFS as a whole was coming through in the technology sector. I mean, the cars were just kind of getting figured out. And where they are now, I mean, you can you you're the testament. It's vastly different, vastly stronger, vastly much more over engineered things like that. Uh, was it were you fighting those bugs? Or was it still just trying to get the entire package to work together? So with an IFS car, 
it's typically not the IFS that causes the problem. So the IFS doesn't fail. You can drive them so much harder and faster that the rest of the components can't keep up with them. Really? So that that was part of the problem with the transmissions is you know we kept we so through that season I failed the transmission at every single race for like the next the like the next five races mm -hmm. until we called Gearworks and and uh, and they set us up with a trophy truck transmission and and then all our problems were were pretty much solved at that point uh, they it just was kind of back to that you have to be willing to to spend the budget and make sure you have the right parts on your race vehicles because if you just keep kicking the dead horse and failing and, and not finishing races it breaks your morale it breaks yeah. your guys morale nobody wants to come help you co-drive with you nobody wants to change the transmission six times in the dirt at koh it's like it it breaks you and yeah so, I can imagine yeah and so that so the end of 2013 i uh, i was i was ready to go back to a solid axle car i had sold that two seat solid axle Jimmy's car um, to a guy up in Sacramento. And he, he just, he would, he racing wasn't for him. He didn't want to do it. He couldn't sell the car and he made me a deal that I just, I couldn't refuse the deal on it. I, yeah. I mean, it was pennies on the dollar, but he just, he wanted to come back to me. So I went and picked up the car in Sacramento. We turned around, drove straight to, uh, to Arkansas, to hot springs. Ooh. One. Yep. And left the IFS car at home. We we're still trying to figure out the bugs and, and you know the technology. Won that race in Arkansas, and uh, in this in this old solid axle car, you know that I that I bought back for the guy for peanuts. Uh, yeah. Won that race in Arkansas, and then uh, really started trying to think of what I was going to do uh, for for the future. I, I, it's back to that solid axle IFS debate. It sure. still won't go away. Eric Miller still whooping our butts in, in his solid axle car. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's back to that same debate again. And yeah. so went into KOA or went into the off season, uh, you know, excited that I just won a, a race at the end of the season, you know, morale was high. And uh, I sold that two seat IFS car, had a decent, you know, chunk of, of seed money. And that's when we started dreaming up the red dragon. So yeah. talking, we, I was really watching what pro four technology was doing at that time and how they were building pro fours, mm -hmm. which is essentially what the red dragon was. Um, motor was sitting up front, but it was sitting next to you and said mm -hmm. all the mid engine IFS cars, like, you know, what everybody was building in ultra four at that time. And we're sitting there, uh, you know, looking, looking on the chassis table and we're like, well, let's just flip the motor around. Why can't it be sitting there like a pro four? And so we went in, I was going to try to have the red dragon ready for KOH in 2014 mm -hmm. as all race cars go, you know, couldn't get parts, couldn't get it wrapped up, couldn't get it tested. We're in this, the same scenario this year, you know, yeah. trying to build new trucks and, and, you know, <laughs> will we make the deadline or not? <laughs> but, uh, so that car didn't get finished. And I, I took that old solid axle car out to KOH again. Um, you know, that I bought back that was kind of just a spare old little hoopty and and one KOH in, in that car in 2014. So that, that was my big, you know, changing moment, I think, of my racing career. When I went from, uh, you know, winning KOH a second time, as well as taking things very professionally, like, you know, putting that professionally focused into a race team. Yeah. And so we came out and debuted the Red Dragon right after that. And that thing won. I mean, I won every race in it for almost two years, yeah. except for a KOH in 2015. I mean, it, the thing just came out and dominated. I think I won nine out of 10 races, mm -hmm. won like five, four championships, you know, in, in two years. Like it just, it really changed everything for me. And I don't know if it really changed Ultra 4 that much, but um, really changed the way. Uh, our race program was working and we started really attracting, you know, some actual financial budget to, to really help us take everything serious. Well, I would tell you this, you know, you mentioned, uh, did it change ultra four? You kind of brought that notion up. I would say it had to, because, you know, there was still the debate, I guess, had a lot more, I'm going to say this and then ignore the fact of what happened, you know, at Oklahoma and for the national series, but it really changed the debate of solid axle versus IFS. And it really, I mean, you got the meat behind IFS. There was now proof in the pudding when you, when you were able to do all those races and win. Um, 
I think you changed the direction because you know it opened up the doors for so many different cars that we have now because you showed that it worked and it worked in you know every scenario and now we've seen ifs cars win king of hammers time and time again it's one of those things that the technology works so in my opinion the argument is is a, is a lot more 50 50 and then switches 51 49 you know depending on the day but uh, I, would, I would definitely say that you had a large hand in changing the direction of Ultra 4. Now, my question for you is, as that direction changed, is do you think that there was any impact from the cars that were being built, switching over to IFS, into the track choices, into the trail choices, like at King of Hammers, you know, running certain trails a certain direction, things like that. I know it gets mixed up every year. But do you think that, you know, Dave Cole and his infinite wisdom started to see the trending topic here and started integrating more things, more short course and, you know, not necessarily, you know, outside of King of Hammers, we and, and maybe area BFE, we rarely get those monster, you know, hard rock crawling, you know, long sections. There's right. more of the high speed stuff in there. Um, do you think that that came into play in that about that time frame? We, we were definitely doing a lot of short course racing at that point. And I think Ultra 4 was still growing at that point. And the, and the short course races were a lot easier for Dave to show up with five people and mm -hmm. run a race. You know, Glen yeah. Ellen, Salt Lake, those type of places. You know, at, at KOH, he's got a thousand volunteers. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, so I think at that point it was we were all still kind of growing together. Mm -hmm. And so that's why. That's why we were seeing a little bit more short course then than maybe we do now. Um, and for your question about the trails, I I think that KOH has gotten easier. I don't disagree with that. Like the first three or four years, I never could get through KOH without winching. There was at one point during the race, you had to get out and winch an obstacle or two. It was that big and that hard. But I also think that the, the traffic jams that we saw in like 14, 15, 16, I don't really feel like they were IFS car related. I think it was just the cars were getting faster and stacked up on top of each other. The trails were getting dug out a little bit from all the traffic through them. Mm -hmm. And it just made it to where you would get that obstacle that, that had to be winched by a hundred people. And, and it wasn't possible as KOH started evolving. So we used to just run one desert lap and one rock lap, right? Mm -hmm. There wasn't ever a second rock lap. And so it wasn't a problem if the first 10 guys got through and then everybody else was winching and, and it, you know, but when they started adding that second lap in the big trail plugs and the big canyons full of cars that weren't moving really started to develop more, more and more. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's why KOH has gotten a little bit easier. Those years of Dave getting his, his balls kicked in for the traffic yeah. jams. He yeah. needed to stop that. Like it, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a race. If you were back there in that traffic jam and the leaders were checking out from you, it wasn't fair. You know, if you, if you weren't in the top five, you didn't have a chance. And, and so I don't, I think that's why it's gotten a little bit easier. I'm still here to tell you that KOH last year in 2020 in February, I still felt like I had my kidneys kicked, kicked in in a car wreck for eight hours. So yeah. it's still not easy. Yeah. The rocks have gotten a little bit easier, but it still beats you to death. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, when you say the rocks have gotten easier again, I haven't been there. Disclaimer, haven't been there. Haven't seen the person, you know, it's hard for me to compare year to year. You're still talking about some of the hardest rock trails in the, in the country. You know, you're still talking some of the most massive trails to be racing on period. And I think that you're right. The issue was, you know, fluidity through the racetrack. And uh, I don't know, on top of all that, we have technology getting faster. You know, you briefly mentioned the cars get faster, so they'll get to certain locations faster and so on and so forth. Uh, but there is a lot there, and, and we'll talk about that probably in a little while. But uh, you have that success. You win King of Hammers for the second time, and, and you go on the streak of winning. You know, where does that place you now? Because now you're in a real cool spot. Last year, you debuted the Bronco car, which is, uh, well, we've, I will call it debuting the Bronco car. And, uh, you know, we're just spinning up to this new level uh, of professionalism. And, and I don't want to say productivity, but uh, we're just seeing, like, you guys really hit your stride in terms of, like, race team and development. And the whole system seems to be working better. So was there any adjustments that you as the driver and, and the, the leader, the driving force of the team, uh, did you make any adjustments to kind of get all the wheels turning together? 
Uh, you know, I think about that time was when social media started really becoming active. I mean, Facebook and that stuff was around in like 2012. In fact, when I signed with Nitto then, that was part of my contract that I had to get a Facebook account and mm -hmm. create these athletes accounts. I, I didn't want to do it. I, I wasn't a fan of social media, mm -hmm. but uh, it, they, they could see the writing on the wall and that, that was the future. So I think social media has really driven that stuff quite a bit. Um, 2000, like 2016 through to, through 2018, you know, we, I guess maybe for my program, it was kind of stagnant. You know, we were still racing eight to 10 races a year. So mm -hmm. winning some races, um, we had some, some new marketing partners that were all in the industry, but you know, that were, that were good partners and, and were great for our program and, and really were helping us get out there. And, uh, you know, it, when Bongit Jr. and I met and started really talking and, you know, talking the future and, and putting things together, I think that was probably the next big thing that really sticks out in my career and mm -hmm. how his knowledge and the things he brought from another form of motorsports that was more successful, you know, with more viewership, more spectators, and how they focused on getting the drivers out there and making sure the spectators were seeing this crazy cool stuff that we were doing and bringing a, just bringing his view into our program and helping us kind of figure out how the stuff that he was really, really good at, how he could help our program. And then the stuff that I was really good at as far as, you know, prepping, doing mechanical on, on race trucks, you know, guiding him through race trucks, mm -hmm. taking over his race side. Uh, it, it just worked well, you know, together and, and that's when things really have started to take off, like you said, in the last couple of years. So, you know, he knew Bronco was coming. It, it wasn't a coincidence that, <laughs> that, you know, Ford was bringing out the Bronco. We've all been hearing about it for four or five years. Um, he showed up at KOH. I, I think this was this year was, I think, his fifth year, either his fourth or fifth year race in Ultra 4. But he showed up out there when Nitto um, had a spec car that they owned and and offered Vaughn up to come drive it. And he's always down for a crazy adventure and yeah. showed up out on the lake bed. And, and he tells the story of, uh, of me jumping in that spec car with him and taking him out the old qualifying course to this waterfall. And it's, you know, to me, it, it's something you probably could have drove in two wheel drive and, and popped right up. But he had never been in Johnson Valley. He'd never rock crawled. He'd never climbed anything before. And, uh, I, you know, he didn't know how to put the car in low range. I mean, he knew nothing about yeah. what we were doing it. So I taught him how to put it in low range, how to climb up this waterfall. It, it was kind of tough, but it wasn't anything crazy. Yeah. And that has stuck with him. I mean, to this very day of like how eye opening and, and inspiring that was. And, uh, you know, since then we just, we really have had hit it off and he always bounced ideas off of me and, and, same with same with him. I was always asking how to approach marketing partners and and yeah. how to do that type of stuff. And you know, this relationship just kind of formed into the fun ever off road team. And things just they escalated very very quickly. As soon as we started talking about it, we had all these partners that Vaughn had been working with for years. You know, Ford, Shell Rotel, Monster, all asking. We love we love seeing the new changes that you guys are doing and what, what you guys are bringing to the fun have off road team. Like how, how do we do more? How can we see more of this? Like we want to work with you guys. Let's listen. You guys are doing amazing stuff. And, and it's, it's just really, it's the running joke around here is things escalate at an unreal uh, rapid pace to, to just crazy more levels. I understand. Trust me. I, I'm at the point now with the podcast where I'm trying to like create manageable growth for it because I can't handle everything that's kind of starting to, to roll the ball that's starting to roll. And it's, it's something that, you know, you don't, you kind of laugh at before you get here and then you get here and you're like, okay, like, well, we need to, you know, something's, we got to build a strategy to handle all this stuff because it gets very overwhelming very quickly. Um, but that being said, uh, before we talk about the fun haver team, I want to talk about this season for you. Um, so King of Hammers this year was a seventh place finish. Is that correct? It was. It was a seventh place finish. Um, yeah, debuted the new, I, I call it the Bronco inspired Ultra 4 truck. It's uh, um, running a Ford D3 motor. So uh, a little bit older NASCAR technology. You know, we've got a Bronco aluminum front clip on it. So that's what, that's why I call it the Bronco inspired Ultra 4 truck. Uh, yeah. Bond runs the, the 
early Bronco or the, you know, late sixties, early seventies, fiberglass body on his, mm -hmm. we couldn't quite figure out how to make that on, a, on the car I bought from Paul Herschel. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we just kind of rolled with it for this year. Uh, next year we'll, you'll see a whole bunch of cool new stuff with, with our cool. team and, and some stuff I can't quite talk about yet, but yeah. uh, and it's going to be exciting. So, um, but yeah, King of the Hammers, uh, debuted the new, the new Bronco inspired ultra four single seat truck. Um, and the first time I ever put that truck into, into kind of race mode, I went and tested and done some pre running stuff in it, but you never really know with a race truck, what's, how it's going to act until it's time to, time to go. It's time yeah. to race. It's time to move. And I jumped in there and qualifying and, and ran what I felt was a mellow conservative pace and, and put it on the pole by a few seconds. And I was like, Oh my, I've got a race truck. Now. Like, <laughs> this is the best thing I've ever driven. It feels so good. I'm so relaxed in it. Like I'm, I am so excited for this season and, and where everything's going to go. So, you know, uh, race day, I've, I've really had to learn over the years. I feel like 10 years of racing KOH or, you know, wherever I'm at 12 years, every year I've learned a really hard lesson of how to, how to, how to break the car, how to, how to not get to the finish line. Like yeah. I've, I've learned hard lessons on, I've either finished like in the top five, six, seven, mm -hmm. or I've DNF the race. So yeah. this year I, I, well, I'm sorry. Let me back up to last year. I, I burned the car down in the desert, uh, mm -hmm. trying to pass Nick Nelson and Jason Shear and broke the transfer case, trying to pass them, you know, mm -hmm. get giant, just, just pushing too hard. And that's what that desert lap is designed to do. Dave's no dummy. He wants to, to have a bunch of attrition out there in the desert before anybody even gets out to the rocks mm -hmm. and uh, to, to try to cut down on those rock jams like we were talking about earlier. But so this year, you know, Jason and I are going off the line side by side. Him and I have had some unreal battles, you know, over the last four or five years because yeah. we're almost always qualify up there near each other. And we've just battled back and forth on those desert laps. And, and I told myself before I even got in the car that day that I was going to let him go in the desert lap. I was going to let him get where I couldn't see his dust. And then I was going to run my pace. And, and that's exactly what I did. Um, you know, the desert lap, I came in second. I was a few minutes behind Jason. My pace was absolutely perfect. As soon as we went out for the second lap, um, I passed Jason. He was changing a tire or doing something. And, you know, things, things were clicking off exactly how it's felt like, you know, when I've won KOH the years before I, yeah. the plan was going exactly as I wanted it to. And we got about, I don't know, half, half to three quarters of the way through the, through the first rock lap. And, uh, I, I just, I came over a boulder a little bit awkward and, and slipped through a drive shaft onto it. Mm. And so there's, you, you know, I've, uh, this year I've, I've had a couple, I had a drive shaft issue in, uh, at Moab this year as well. And there's, there's a, a give and take. Um, you can run a high pinion rear diff that, that some people run, but it's a weaker, it's a weaker situation. Um, Vaughn failed one, Paul Herschel failed one. Uh, they're at KOH this year. So it's this weird give or take where I can get out and change a drive shaft and still keep racing or you fail the gear set and maybe that's the end of your day. So yeah. it's, it's a little bit of tough, tech for me i i wish that we could find out a better way to run a high pinion or get that drive shaft out of the rocks on those cars so but by the by the time i got out of the car changed the rear drive shaft and while i was changing the drive shaft i didn't pay enough attention to what actually caused the failure um the drive shaft actually came completely out of the car and so i didn't notice that the skid plate that was up underneath the differential was actually what had caused the failure and the rocks that were hitting the skid plate pushed the skid plate up into the rear drive shaft yeah. and pushed the U-joint out of it. Well, because it was all out of the car, um, by the time I got out to look at it, I just put a new drive shaft in and left the skid plane out and didn't think anything of it. Mm -hmm. I was still, I'm, uh, three or four cars had gotten past me, but I was still in contention. I still could have won the race, changing a drive shaft. Um, uh, but I got into the next rock section. We were, I, I passed the pits. I had the guys throw another drive shaft on me real quick on the back of the car. So I had a spare and was going through spooners and outer limits and was just about out of the last rock section to finish the last rock lap. And it happened again. I kissed that skid plate. I did. And I got out and I felt it happen. And I got out, I felt the vibration right away and got out to assess what had happened. And the drive shaft was perfect, but the U-joint caps were missing out of, out of the drive shaft. 
And so that's when I realized that the that the skid plate had had opened up the holes a little bit and was was kissing just barely kissing the U joint and kissing yeah. making the making the U joint cap skid out. So so at that point I I had no choice but to replace the drive shaft again. But this time I took the skid plate off and and I the I had the tools to do it, but not the tools to do it quickly. And it took me about 30, 30 minutes to change the change the drive shaft skid plate. And at that point. I think I had dropped back to 25th or, you know, so, a long ways away and knew I, I wasn't racing to win and K, win KOH that day. You know, I had a whole nother rock lap to go. I was, I was a ways back in the field and that I needed, I really needed to get to the finish line. I had DNF KOH the two years before. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of one of those times where you look back in your career where like, you just, you, you got to get to the finish line to, 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 you know, really, really show that you can do it no matter what happens and, and what fails or what breaks. So, um, went into, to just get there and, and I ended up seventh for the day. Um, I, I had, I felt like I had the race car to win KOH this year. Um, you know, I was in the best shape I've ever been, you know, which is a huge part of racing King of the Hammers. Before. Some people don't take that near seriously enough, but I, it just, you know, it was, it was almost heartbreaking a little bit at the finish line. You could, you could see the defeat in my face of, yeah. of, of having that, that race. I mean, I can win all the races I want through the rest of the season, but KOH is the one that I want really, really bad more than anything. Yeah. I always say on the show, you know, you can't tell me who won in 2000 in whatever year who won the national championship, but you can tell me who won King of Hammers that year. Uh, yeah. so I understand for sure. Uh, and that is, that is so heartbreaking to have just something that you missed the first time. And the, the, I guess the, the upside is that you were able to finish and you were able to kind of close the door. Uh, and I'm sure that you have a different skid plate set up now. <laughs> De definitely do. Definitely do. And uh, yeah, I mean, as, as part of KOH, you can control your destiny at most of the other races, but KOH just it just kicks you in the nuts over and over and over again. And it's it's how you deal with it. I mean, it's I don't know. It's so hard to even explain how hard and how many things can bite you in the butt out there. Yeah, I can only imagine. So my plan right now, I've got a I've got a little boy coming in this February, and my plan is for 2022 for uh, the show and me and everybody to be out there on the lake bed. So very excited to be out there and see it for myself. But um, going forward, the next race, I believe, was uh, AOP at uh, Teardown in Tennessee. It, it was. And so that's been my running joke this year was uh, I don't know how much Eric Miller and Josh Weiler paid Dave Cole to uh, to get the whole West Coast, you know, <laughs> Ultra 4 series this year turned into an East Coast race. Yeah. But they sure did it. Even Moab, which, you know, should have been a West Coast race was was a straight straight east coast race with a no go fast and very technical rock bouncing course so um yeah. but yeah we went to adventure off road park um i'm i mean you i've never hidden it before i'm not a big fan of of the tree dodging and yeah. of the mud that's just not my style but when that was my choice to race i mean that's where we're going i'll i'll, I'll do it every time I'll, I'll always go there and and have fun in a race car so um, that race did not go great for me was, you know, the Eric and Josh have those solid axle cars so dialed for ripping through the trees that yeah. our, our big desert cars. And, you know, the other person that needs to be in that conversation is Derek West. Those, those three are so ridiculous in the trees and in the mud. It's just, it's, it's unreal. I've never, I mean, it, it just amazes me to be anywhere near them following them through the trees or racing with them. But, uh, race i the race what didn't go great for me adventure off road park uh i ended up with a, a rag i had stuffed a, a bunch of rags in my uh bag next to my leg and when i pulled a rag out all the rags came out of the bag with it and ended up underneath my seat on the exhaust i didn't know it and had a huge fire uh, yeah. and it, it was just it was just a rag fire you know it was just underneath my seat and but had full flames up under my crotch all the way up to my helmet. I mean, it was, it was definitely pretty wild. Um, and, and that, that sent me back a little bit. I inhaled some fumes. I felt almost drunk when I got back in the race car and, uh, kept my, it kind of like melted the bottom of my seat and stuff like that. So I, I felt like kind of dizzy the whole rest of the race, but, um, got to the finish line. I, I, I couldn't even tell you, I think it was like 13th or 15th or something like that, which was, I was still in the points. I mean, I, I ended up, uh, top five in the championship this year and still, you know, ended up 
in the points and it was it was helping me keep in the points for the year because we were going out and hitting all these races but, mm-hmm. but yeah i mean adventure off-road park uh chalk that up to uh to, uh, to an east coast tree dodge in race that i'm not in a huge hurry to go back to <laughs> so they are running it next year are you going to run exclusively the west coast do you think you'll make your way over here so i just been working on my schedule for next year um my plan is to run the west coast stuff and then i'll probably run the north uh, because oh, yeah. Because they've got these crossover races yeah. this year, which I think are really cool. So I believe Crandon and Sturgis mm-hmm. also count towards the north. Mm-hmm. So there's one race up there in Montana that if I'm going to run those, I'm already running Sturgis and Crandon. Mm-hmm. I might as well go hit that race up in Montana and see see you know if I can do something there too. So yeah. um, I don't have a single East Coast race unless you count count Crandon out of the East Coast series. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll uh, tell you that the, the other park they're running is Dirty Turtle, and it's that's a I mean that is a beast of a park. It's very yeah, it's yeah. a super small park, but man. It is a beast, so I uh, I don't blame you for going there because that's the park that a lot of the East Coast rock bouncers. I mean, there are some hills there that are uh, not friendly to anybody. I'll say it like that. Um, so sure. I don't I don't blame you. But I want to go back to AOP for a second because one, uh, I think that you were the widest car in there. Your car measures about what ninety six inches wheel to wheel. Is that what it was? It's not quite that bad. So this new one that uh, Paul Herschel. Uh, sold to me that, that I've been racing this year. It's like 92 and a half, but yeah. it is, it's a big girl. Uh, yes. I mean, and, and Shannon, Shannon's new cars are, are similar to that. And with uh, Paul's cars, you know, pretty much that same with, so all the IFS cars were at a pretty substantial disadvantage there in the trees. Mm-hmm. Not, not that any of us are really scared about climbing big stuff or, I mean, I love that, but the wet slick rocks and the, and the tight technical trees are which are what are just brutal. Our, our wheelbase is usually, you know, a, a good six to 12 inches longer too for, for the, mm-hmm. for the go fast stuff, stuff in the desert. Yeah. And again, you're, you guys are all at the same level and it, like the tires are so big, the cars are big, they have plenty of power that the actual obstacles themselves aren't really that big of a deal. It is the maneuverability between it because uh, I go to adventures an hour from my house. So it's super local to me. I've run every trail there and it is a mess all the time. So I completely understand uh, exactly your feelings. It's rough mess. You can't go faster than, you know, 30 miles an hour or else you're going to be running into something or car parts are going to be flying off your car. So I understand, but yep. you go to Moab and then, uh, so they haven't run area BFE in a, in a, in a couple of years. Is that right? Yep. Yep. So we, we went to Crandon right before Moab. So I was pretty, yeah. I was pretty excited coming off of back-to-back wins in Crandon. Um, yeah. I, I hadn't been able to get the monkey off my back there. Uh, I had a bunch of second places and third places. I've been, I love Crandon, but if you get a chance to go up there next year for the ultra four race, you really need to do it. The, the spectators, it's, it's an East coast king of the hammers, 50,000 people come out. They camp for the whole week. They party, they have concerts. Uh, it, it is an amazing opera as unlike anything I've ever been on. Uh, I've raced a ton of Lucas oil tracks, a, a lot of stuff, but there is nothing like Crandon for a short course race. So now, I, do they I, have a trail system there? Like if I were to come up there, bring my machine, is there anything for me to do like trail riding wise? There, there is some trails that run out the back um, mm-hmm. behind there. And I don't know, it's, it's probably not anything rock crawling wise. It would just be like normal dirt trail riding in the trees, that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. So not, not anything real. They, they built that rock course in the back in the quarry um specifically for the ultra four trucks that that come race there and i don't know who saw bailey cole's car in the in the pond this year but that that was insane (laughs) dude with the craziest parts they had it running the next day yeah yeah they they busted their butts to uh to work to work a lot of magic to get that thing running yeah absolutely and i want to say that there's a video of that of his in his cockpit view of him driving into a full pond and submerging his 4400 car but also there's a there's a video on all your social media as well of the aop fire which i'll tell you this you know i've been in you know hans helmet you know strapped in the whole nine yards window nets everything you got out of that car in record speed and you got the fire extinguisher so quick i was so impressed because you know when that adrenaline kicks in and everything's going i would you know with the mud that's on your gloves and everything else i would be in there slipping and probably not being able to get out so i was really like impressed you got out of there in like less than 10 seconds it was very very cool 
So a little bit of admission there, though. Uh, we'll, we'll call that some media magic because oh, that, okay. that, that was my media team and that was Preston uh, yeah. making me look look like a superstar and I thanked him for it afterwards. But I'll admit, I can, I got out of the car that fast. No no question. I've, I've mm -hmm. practiced getting out of the car in those situations and have been in those situations so many times that, that getting out of the car, I can do it two or three seconds. I mean, that's just second nature. But when I went to pull the fire extinguisher off the back of the car, I couldn't get it unpinned. Ooh. And that's, I don't know if there was video of me kicking it and trying to beat it off of there or not. I, I can't remember if people saw that. And then I ran back to the inside fire extinguisher and we, we had bought these fancy new element fire extinguishers. They're like 150 bucks a piece there. They work, they're, they're really, really neat technology. And I read it and the way I saw it was that you strike it like a striker. So you take the cap off, you strike it like you just smack it down like a fire flare, mm -hmm. uh, like a side road flare. Well, come to find out, you have to take the striker off the top and it strikes the bottom of it. And I couldn't figure it out for like 30 <laughs> seconds. So I'm sitting there trying to read the fire extinguisher, how to make this stupid thing light off. I finally give up. I chunk that thing in the woods and run back to the back fire extinguisher that's full of mud on the pin. Yeah. And I beat it to death, punching it, kicking it and finally got it off like probably 45 seconds later so okay. yeah we're, we're gonna call that media magic and yeah. uh and i'm grateful for my guys making me look good and i haven't told many people that story <laughs> yeah no that's that's amazing because it it looks flawless in the video so they did a great job but yeah, uh, anyways, i want to talk about crandon before we go to area bfe i had forgotten that that was before the other yeah. um so you guys ran a, a night race and then did 4400 run again the next day yeah, that's how they normally do it. So uh, the the spectators there love the night race, and they're the hardcore crowd has never seen what ultra four trucks can do. Right. And so they all go back and and pack into the trees and watch us run through the crazy rock section. And uh, so we yeah we had to run the night race, and when we parked my car in the pits that night, we went to back it back it in the pits and had lost reverse. Cool. So we get done with the night race at at uh, at like midnight. And and it's time for Porter and myself and and my guys to uh, to change the transmission, you know. And it was freezing cold. We could see our breath. I mean, we we worked all night to get the car back together, spare transmission in it, and uh, and ready to race the next morning. But yeah, so so we race night and then we turn around and go go again. And we get to run just the the normal Crandon track for the day race, which is that one. That one's. I mean, it's it's one of my favorite things to do by far. Yeah, you guys, I mean, I'm stealing Miles' saying here, but you guys seriously were hauling the mail. It was an amazing display of the technology, just how hard that a few of you guys with the car setups you have, how hard you can drive it in the corners was just like, how big is that car and how fast is it going in the corner? It was mind blowing. It's just just seeing it in the, in the element of that pure, dedicated, like short course style, it's really unique. We don't get to see that a lot as a 4400 fan. So that was the first time that I had personally ever watched a Crandon race. And now it's on my calendar every year because it's so cool that they just, I mean, you, you know, you turn on the live feed and then you have a full day of racing. There's no real intermission and it's, you know, na big name after big name and awesome classes and this and that. Um, but I wanted to ask you too, you do some UTV racing as well. Did you do any UTV racing at Crandon? I didn't. So those guys are so, they have specific built short course cars. Yeah. And all, all I have is my KOH car. And it seems like anytime I take that thing to race against specific desert cars or specific short course cars, I just get my clock cleaned. I just, I can't, yeah. I can't keep up with those guys and their specific built cars. And I don't have enough seat time at what they do. Yeah. And there's nothing good for my image of me being out there running around in 20. <laughs> I trust me. I get it. I, yeah. I didn't realize how much weight they reduced off of those cars. And like they run such small gas tanks and everything like that. I figured that they had, you know, like a, like the pro mod class was, you know, just a regular, you know, machine just beefed up like everybody else. But I, they really do some amazing modification to get weight off those cars and get them nice and stiff. It was, it was, I was impressed to say the least. Uh, and on top of that, a Polaris won the UTV class. I was excited to see that as well. Uh, but long story short, uh, you, you, you have that race, you go to area BFE. We they haven't raced there in a while, a few years. Uh, what did you think going back to that area? And then tell me about the race itself. 
So I had the advantage of racing at BFE and the dirt ride at the end. Um, early, probably 2011, 12, mm -hmm. um, Big Rich used to run dirt ride races there. And so I knew how miserable BFE was going to be the second yeah. Dave told us we were going racing there. Um, it's, you know, and, and unfortunately that spectator passed away, uh, that was watching the race. They got mm -hmm. hit by a race car and which kind of ended the race in there at area BFE and, and mm -hmm. kind of was helped towards BFE kind of getting shut down. But, um, it was, I mean, I, I knew it was coming. It, it beats you to death. It's, it's like running King of the Hammers, but never getting to go out into the desert, and catch a rat. So you're just bouncing through jackhammer, sledgehammer, yeah. you know, talk of thunder all day long. And it, it took three and a half, four hours of just getting our kidneys kicked in to finally get to the finish line there. Yeah. But I mean, uh, so pulling up the, the data on my GPS, I the fastest I went all day was 36 miles an hour. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That is not something you can normally say for an ultra four race. No, no. I mean, even even at AOP, we had a couple straightaways where we could get up to 80, 90 miles an hour. And so um, I, I really I fought some stuff there at Moab that I hadn't ever fought before um, because of the lack of airflow over my race car. We never get up and get moving at pace and, and dissipate some of the heat off of it. Um, I fought fought some fuel pump issues that I'd never I haven't fought you know, since 2010 with, with, uh, and it, it was really hot out too. It was, it was close to like 90 or hundred during uh, while we were racing. But, um, so my motor started running real lean when I started losing fuel pressure and then my exhaust was like glowing red hot and, and, uh, radiated the heat through my floorboard and it burnt my foot like yeah. with third degree burns through on my foot, which still isn't even all healed, healed up. Like it, I actually wasn't sure if I was going to be able to race Oklahoma because because it burnt me so bad. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Well, that's I'm mean, first off, I'm glad you're okay and you were able to race and all that fun stuff. But man, that's that's hot and uh, wow, that is uh, that's uh, it's hard to believe that you know it's it's just like a not necessarily a missing piece, but like you never would have discovered it unless you guys had gone there and done that type of real slow course and then. You know, now I'm assuming you guys have probably addressed some kind of cooling system for that. <laughs> yeah, we did. We changed up to brushless fuel pumps and changed my exhaust. We put some header shield on the exhaust. And we, we did. We made a lot of changes. And the ER doc that analyzed my foot afterwards, he said, you need skin grafts. Um, and and uh, I asked him how long that, that it was going to take to heal because I had to race in Oklahoma in four weeks. And, and he said, you're not racing in Oklahoma in four weeks. And so I said, I'm not getting skin grafts in. Wow. <laughs> and left. So, um, luckily, I had some advice from, from some other doctors that told me I'd probably be okay, and and we got it healed up good enough to to race in Oklahoma. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's scary stuff. And and the crazy thing was, is I I didn't feel myself getting burned during the race. I felt it a little hot, but I think all the sweat was running off of me down into my towards my socks, and I had yeah. fire shoes on, uh, a heel cup that like the NASCAR guys race. Um, full fire shoes. I mean, I had all the safety stuff on and I think the sweat was running down in there and I think it actually kind of boiled my foot. Was, oh yeah. That's awful. It was, yeah. It, it, it was wild. Yeah. yeah. So where'd you finish at uh, the Utah race? Same, 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 similar spot as AOP. Uh, I think I ended up like 13th or something. Okay. Um, had, had a few flat tires. And then like I was saying, I, I landed on the rear drive shaft and had to change the drive shaft again. So the, the laps were, I think we ran seven laps there and they were, we were running like 22, 25 minute laps. So by the time I changed, changed a couple tires and fixed the rear drive shaft, I was, I was a lap down on the leaders and, and just trying to get to the finish line. So before we talk about Oklahoma, I want to ask um, the, you know, it's relatively recent, the, you know, uh, what is it? Anti-puncture systems for the tires. There's recently been a change where you can't run an anti-puncture system in those tires. What are your thoughts on that running, you know, these big case spec tires and obviously creates a huge weak point in these machines. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I, I get it. It was the tire manufacturers and maybe even specifically Nitto that, that was pushing for that. Mm -hmm. um, they put millions of dollars into the development of the case spec tires and they, they pushed very hard and the tires that were much weaker tires were able to compete with them 
because of this, because they filled them full of tire balls and, and yeah. everybody could drive on a flat tire and, you know, you could come across the line with four dead tires. Yeah. The other thing is, is, is I think the tire balls created more flats because they don't allow your sidewall flex. Mm -hmm. They're pushing out on it. So the, the my flats have went down probably 50 to 75 percent of taking the tire balls out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm not going to tell you I don't miss the days of, of hitting the rock piles at nationals at 100 <laughs> miles an hour because I had no regards for my tires. Yeah. But um, at the same time, I'm grateful to be partnered with a company like Nitto who who builds the best tires for King of the Hammers and Ultra 4 Racing. And, yeah. you know, it's I, I also can tell you 100% that I don't miss mounting tires with tire balls either. It's, yeah. it's 45 minutes to an hour every tire to fill them full of tire balls, fill them full of slime you know, disinflate them, reinflate them. Like yeah. it, it was a nightmare mount them. And now I can mount 10 tires in an hour. So I, I don't know, man. It, uh, everybody was upset about it in mm -hmm. the beginning when it happened, but life goes on. It's uh, it's part of stuff you just got to deal with. And and I don't really miss them at all. We were, we were just joking as we were cleaning the shop for this, uh, this week, we've got probably 20 sets of tire balls all in trash bags sitting up there. <laughs> like, do we throw these away or what do we do with them? It's probably twenty thousand dollars worth of tire balls sitting up. I was there. about to say you ship them to your favorite podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man, if, if you want some tire balls, I will send you some tire balls. Like yeah, if you send me a tire ball and you autograph it, I will put it right on this nice <laughs> shelf right here and it'll be it'll have your name on it. It'll be on every podcast. All right, we can so do that. <laughs> you you do that and I'll put it up there for sure. Um, but that's I think it's good. Uh I think that the tire change itself is a good thing because I think that, you know, from the consumer of the tires and then you have the consumer of ultra four. So from the consumer of tires, knowing that you guys aren't running any anti-puncture systems, it really does add some validity to the tire differences actually make a choice or actually, excuse me, the choice in tires make a difference. Um, Cause I see you guys and you know, so-and-so may change four tires in a race and so-and-so may only get one. So it is a little bit more reflective of the quality of the product. So I, I think that as a tire consumer, that is definitely something. But I also think as a consumer of Ultra 4, it's kind of the argument of like the NFL with steroids and the NFL without steroids. You know, you have, you know, just let them go free and just see how fast and how strong they can be versus, you know, we got to put realistic limitations on these things. So I agree with you. There's a little bit of give and take, but it seems like everyone has kind of mellowed out on it. And, and now, you know. We have guys who who pull the last 50 miles of KOH with a flat and just keep going until they go, and it's it, it there's a certain bit of entertainment that comes with that too. So there's balance, but definitely part of the story. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oklahoma, tell me about it. It was freezing cold, and it just apparently I don't think it's as cold there now, but you guys just got stuck with the weekend where it's like four degrees outside. And, and honestly, the racing weather was amazing. It was it was probably the best weather we raced in all year long. Um, I know from a spectator standpoint, it probably wasn't great sitting outside there, but inside the race truck, um, every time we'd raced in Oklahoma, the the weather, the rain, the mud, the nastiness that's, that's East Coast, it's Oklahoma. We've had to deal with it there, and this year's race was absolutely amazing. The course, uh, Justin and Trotter put in so much work out there. To me, that's the closest thing we have to King of the Hammers. Is, is really? our, yep. I, I really do think because we have some wide open stuff where we're hitting 90 and 100 miles an hour. And then we have some, you know, some decent real rock sections and, and some more technical stuff that you have to slow down and, and rock crawl through. So um, uh, I, I've traditionally done decent at Oklahoma. I won it a couple of years ago. Um, and, and this year, I, I felt like I was on pace to do well there this year, too. I, I qualified second, I think, second or, yeah, I think I qualified second mm -hmm. um, and had really clean, fresh air all day. One of the things that Dave implemented there was the new USAC timing. So before our guys are in the pits with a, with a stopwatch and their cell phones and they're trying to keep track of where people are at and, yeah. and where people are, are, are on adjusted time. Well, with this USAC timing this year, and it may have helped Eric, um, you know, know that he was close enough to win that race. But we knew exactly where we were at. The second we crossed the finish line, we knew where we were at on adjusted time right. and how hard to push and and how the race developed. And that race has always been really hard on tires. So I, I went out there with maybe a little bit of a mellower pace to start. But by the time we were through lap two and myself, Paul Herschel, Vaughn, 
uh, Eric and Blyler were in this just epic battle of within yeah. seconds of each other. Every time we crossed the line, somebody jumped one spot or was, you know, moving around. And, and we saw Eric just charging from the back to the back. You know, he's, oh. he's 15th, he's 12th, he's 7th, he's 5th, he's 3rd. Like, Eric yeah. is coming hot. And so Paul and I and Vaughn, like, for the last two laps, just went into this it balls out full on sprint beating our cars through the rocks and yeah. un unfortunately i mean i was i was sitting second physically paul was in front of me vaughn was behind me and eric was right behind him and uh i i was five miles from the finish line and down in the rock trails and all of a sudden my steering just locked up on me i mean i was out of 120 miles i had i had i had five more miles to go and you know i i don't know i Paul was in front of me, so he was going to get second. Eric was going to beat us all in adjusted time. Um, I don't know if Vaughn and I – it probably would have came down to seconds with Vaughn and I for third and third. But, so it, it may have moved me into third into the championship. It, it, that actually bumped me down to fifth for the championship for the year. But uh, I just – the bolts in my steering rack, and Paul actually told me after the race <laughs> that that's what happened to him at KOH two years ago in that exact car. He's yeah. like, oh, the, the bolts loosened up and sheared off. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, that happened to me at KOH, too. Here's how you fix it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, Paul. <laughs> <You're kind of. laughs> yeah. But, I mean, oh gosh. all good. I It was such a fun race. It was a great championship race. I really hope Ultra 4 figures out how to send us back there. They put yeah. in so much work into that park. And it's, it's a good central location for everybody meeting up. I mean, maybe it's not a national championship, but maybe it's a West Coast race that that is West and East like it was a couple of years ago or or something. It, and racing later in the, the year this year, the weather the weather was actually really good. The rain we got the night before just knocked down the dust. The track was, I mean, it was like a, a you know, a perfectly watered track. It, yeah. it, it was really a fun race, a great way to end the year. You know, I didn't end up, you know, with the with the results I exactly wanted, but I came away from it just you know pumped on the season and and pumped on the year and happy to take a five top five in the championship. So for for 2020, um, I'm I'm glad uh glad the race racing season happened because I mean at times we didn't even know if it was going to happen. So you know it was, it uh it ended up being a good year. Yeah, I would say so. In fifth in 2020 is better than you know the rest of the year how it's going. <laughs> But uh, I'm seeing you guys aren't going to go back to Oklahoma at all next year. Yeah, they completely took it off the schedule. Um, and I, I get what Dave's trying to do. He's trying to keep us in front of spectators. So he's right. he's sending us to Sturgis next year for Bike Week in front of what 500,000 people during the week. Right. Brandon with you know 50,000 spectators there. Uh, Moab, his strategy there is Easter Jeep Safari Week is that week. Yeah. And he's hoping to pull off of that community who traditionally at Easter Jeep Safari, like the vendor show and stuff, when we have our Ultra 4 cars there, most yeah. of that community that's there for Easter Jeep Safari, they don't know who we are. They come by and they ask, what's this vehicle? What What are you guys doing? Like, what, what what's Ultra 4 and King of the Hammers? I'm like, that's my mind, how can, how can you be on a Jeep on 40s and, and not know what King of the Hammers is? Oh, so. There's there's definitely some strategy there on on being in front of everybody at Easter Jeep Safari, um, so I I get it. Um, I don't know how the park at Area BFE is going to handle it because we I think we probably had about sixty percent racer capacity there, and there wasn't another place in the pits to put another vehicle, and there wasn't a single spectator there yet, and nowhere to park anybody, so. They're they're gonna have to get creative, and and that's what JT and Dave do. They they know how to figure out those things. And and Robert Lucario at, at Area BFE, you know they they'll come up with something. That's every time I question something on it, they they find a solution for it. So I just try to keep my mouth shut usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. There's there is value in that because uh, I man, that's if I speaking of which, if you could tell everyone. Uh, to just do that, take that mentality to social media, the world would probably be a lot better place to just take it hands back and just, you know, just see what happens. Just play it, play it by ear. Um, but anyways, you guys are going to run the nationals next year. You're back to Reno. Um, what do you, I know, again, we just mentioned that it's for the, really the spectator side of it. Uh, what are your thoughts on Reno? Cause it's a super short course with like boulders, just, a, you know, hundreds of yards of boulders that are just enormous. Dude, the adrenaline that comes from that race is unreal. 
I look forward to that race probably more than any other race of the season. Um, I've, I've done well. I've won it a couple of times. Um, had it won last, uh, two years ago, but I mean, I had a half a lap lead on it, the whole field. And I sh sheared all the bolts off, uh, off my wheel studs and, and my tire <laughs> went crashing down towards the spectators off the top of the hill, yeah. uh, with, with just a lap or two to go last year. Uh, I substitute drove for Vaughn and Brocky and, and ended up top three there and, uh, kept him in top three in the championship. So I, I love that race. The, the spectator base that's around that Sacramento and, uh, and Reno area, I think is very heavily into ultra four and King of the hammers. There's a very big fan base there and we sell out that place better than anybody else that races. I mean, yeah. we, we usually pack that stadium to the gills and to have that excitement out of the fans and the kids coming over wanting autographs signed and taking door panels off your race trucks. And it's, it's very hard to beat Reno and I don't think it could ever go away as our national championship race. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely one of my favorites by far. It's good to hear that because I, you know, I, I do wish that they had put Oklahoma in here somewhere, but I, 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 a lot of people have vocalized to me that Reno really is, you know, it's a, it's, it's the top notch place. So I'm glad to hear you echo that as well. Um, but right now we're currently in the off season. The, the championship just finished. Um, you mentioned you're going to Mexico or getting prepared for Mexico. What is that about? What do you got going on? So I can never say no to Mexico. <laughs> and, and while we were at nationals, um, Paul Herschel asked me if I would be willing to drive half with him. So he, yeah. he's been planning on racing the ball 1000, uh, you know, all year long and the, the logistics of it and the financial costs of it and having enough trucks and people and everything. It Mexico's no joke. It's more expensive to do than King of the Hammers. Um, it's riskier, you know, safety wise, trying to keep your crew safe, all, all of it. It's, it's Mexico. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I can never say no. And so when Paul asked me, I probably should have told him no, because I really don't have the time and I have a whole bunch of other stuff I was doing, but yeah. any, anytime I get the chance to drive in the ball 1000, uh, uh, sign me up for it. So, so yeah, we've been, we've been knee deep in, uh, in, in Baja prep here at my shop. So I'm taking my fun have a ranger. And then uh, my two seat Polaris Razor and my chase truck down there. And I'll be camping on the San Felipe side where Dave Cole will be with me. Um, some other Ultra 4 drivers, Jason Shears, racing in the Bronco R. So he's camping with us over there. Um, Andrew McLaughlin. So we're going to have a bunch of, of the good, you know, Ultra 4 guys yeah. hanging out, camping, pre-running together. And then and then uh, next Friday or Saturday, we, uh, we jump in the race truck. So Paul's driving the first 400 miles, and then I jump in. I I get the truck at night, so I'll, I'll be jumping in. I'm hoping about 10 p.m., mm -hmm. um, and then I'll have about 400 miles myself to drive Oof. through till about the sun comes up when you really just get super groggy and can't really drive anymore. And then I'll pass the truck back off to Paul. Hopefully he will have gotten some sleep, you know, during that time, got a little rejuvenated. He'll run about the last hundred miles into the finish line. What's it like to essentially you start a race, you have the adrenaline of a race, you know, you have the, the come off of it where, you know, you step out of the car and then you don't realize how tired you are. You basically fall down out of the car to go get some sleep and then get back in the car. I mean, I, I know he's probably getting very little sleep, but I mean, is what is he thinking while he's sitting, you know, at the truck trailer or camp or whatever it is, and he just hands back going, I hope he's like, I'm sure he's keeping up with you, but like, oh, yeah. I have to get sleep. I have to do this again. What is what is that like? Um, so I, I've never actually taken a break like that before. And and Paul even told me, he's like, why don't you go ahead and free run the last hundred miles in case I'm in a situation where I can't get back in the car and yeah. you need to finish it out. So he's like, you know, whoever's in the best, best place or the best situation to finish out the race we'll, we'll go ahead and have that person finish the race. But, um, the, the only thing I can, I can compare to that was like, it, it's been, it was like 2012 Vegas to Reno. Mm -hmm. Um, I got, we went there to race as an ultra four series race and I got my butt handed to me there. Um, we first hundred miles, we had to change a water pump and then, uh, we were moving up through the pack and then like race mile 200, I sheared an upper link bolt and it bent all four shocks off the car, like, Ooh. like just broken bad. And so I limped into the next pit a couple miles away 
and uh, was ready to load the car on the trailer. And and Brian Turner with ADS Shocks walks up to me and he's like, "Hey, dude, uh, I got everything to fix your shocks. It's gonna take me some time, but it, it, you know, you're here. If you want to keep racing, let's fix your shocks." Wow. So, so we're at like race mile 200 of 600, and like three hours later, Brian's got my shocks all back together, <laughs> and he's like. And the, the race is gone. I mean, there is nobody anywhere near me anymore. Yeah. It's dark and they're like, go for it. And so I got back in the car at that point and uh, I drove like another 350, 400 miles that night, finished right as the sun was coming up and the exhaustion level and and like the way my body fatigue has kind of been unlike anything else I can ever remember in a race car. So I'm guessing that uh, this, this trip to Mexico may be similar. Yeah, I would have to imagine. So, so let me ask you this too, because you brought it up earlier, and and I think that it is a very, very critically missed piece. Uh, is the physical shape you have to be in to be a racer? Uh, I had one guy reach out to me. His first race was at AOP, and it was super hot, muggy, it rained, and he and their their air pumper had stopped working. I think he was a little bit of an overweight guy, or or you know something along those lines, and he was like almost ready to quit the race because he couldn't breathe and whatnot. And the you know when you're all masked up and everything, it's hard, it's hot. You're snug in there. What are you doing to get prepared for that? And why is it so important to be in shape for a race where you're sitting in a seat the entire time? It, it It's unreal, the beating that your body takes. And and you have to be able to recover from that as well. Um, I, I spend a ton of time in the gym. I love lifting weights. That's probably from my collegiate sport days. You know, I, I love training and I've really tried to inspire that into my kids as well. But um, I, I do a lot of weight training. And then with... Uh, Oh, with COVID this year, I was looking for kind of more creative ways to to do that. And so I bought a really awesome full suspension mountain bike and I've been doing a lot of a yeah. lot of a lot of uh, mountain bike riding. You know, there there's nothing that seems to whip my butt more than putting 20 miles out on the dirt trails out here around uh, Farmington and Chokecherry Canyon. We have some amazing riding and I never really had the time to go do it. But with, with COVID and me being home more this year, it, it definitely gave me the chance to get out and, and ride a bike a lot. So it's just, you know, getting your cardio up. I know like Jason Shear does a lot of CrossFit stuff. It's just, uh, it's, it's really hard to explain how your, your body and your mind fatigues after an hour or two. And it, and it even happened to me like at, at, at Moab or AOP, you get to the point where you start checking up a little bit and won't hit that rock as hard because it's going to resonate through the, through the race car into your body. Yeah. And, and you have to be able to take that hit. If you, if you want to be able to, to keep racing up front, you have to have the endurance and the conditioning to be able to do it. And a lot of people don't take it serious and fine with me because they're not going to beat me. Agreed. Very much agreed because I always, so uh, people who listen to the podcast realize I talk about this way too much. So I started doing jujitsu in January and one of the most valuable things that I've learned in, in when you're wrestling with somebody and you've got them, if you can just make them uncomfortable nine times out of 10, you know, if you just, you know, you're, you're on top of somebody, you lay your chest on their head and they just make it hard for them to breathe. Sometimes that'll either motivate them to move into a worse position or they'll just, you know, call it a submission right there. That's essentially what having, you know, harnesses, a Hans device or a neck brace, a helmet, everything going and not having like an air feeder system. That's what it feels like. It feels like someone's covering your mouth while you're trying to like suck wind in. And uh, I, I agree with you. I can't imagine racing in the conditions, though, that you guys are racing, especially out west. We just have to deal with it being super humid here. Uh, we don't ever deal with the actual just like dry, nasty heat. I can only imagine how it affects you guys. Yep, absolutely. And and people's diets too. Like, yeah. you know, we, we used to go to drink and party and have fun. And like now it's, it's professionalism. We, I expect that out of my team that they're not out drinking at night uh, yeah. be, because it, it affects your, your clarity. And, and same with me. Like I, I, I make sure I get a lot of sleep that I'm not eating a bunch of crap, you know, and, and making sure that that, that mental clarity is there. Cause it's, it's ridiculously important. And, and some people don't take it very yeah. And I think, again, I think that that's one of those one of those small detail factors that may not come up in like a standard interview or anything. But that's one of those things that, that that's another wheel in the system that's, that's spinning to make a more professional team. The devil's in the details. And that's where you really start to see the polish and something. So hats off to you for doing that. Uh, but during this downtime uh, for the 2021 King of the Hammers, you're looking at racing uh, UTVs and 4400, correct? 
Yep, and maybe one other race I'm not allowed to talk about. So. <laughs> oh, hey, that's exciting. Uh, yep. Before we jump into all of that, uh, let's talk about the schedule. We have an updated schedule this year. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can pull it up, but if you know off the top of your head, I do know that UTVs are running Thursday. I think the EMC is Friday, and then that puts the big cars on uh, Saturday. Is that right? That is correct. That okay. is correct. Okay, perfect. Uh, what do you think about that shift? Whereas UTVs were earlier in the week, because someone who does both, it's it's hard. I'm imagining to probably get everything you need done between those short period of time now. Yes, I I absolutely love the UTVs on Sunday because it I could treat it as two race weeks. I went out, pre ran for the UTV race, prepped the UTV, had my crew focus on the UTV, and then race the UTV and then put it away. You know, we could go pre run in and do whatever we want from that point. But it didn't have to be worked on. It didn't. We didn't have to focus on the UTVs at all at that point. And then starting Monday, we could focus on the Ultra Four track. Yeah. And so this year's going to be pretty tough on trying to do all of that. So um, we've we've got a lot up in the in the air right now. And I I, I honestly couldn't even tell you exactly what I'll be doing. Um, I don't know if you saw. I I've been racing with my 14 year old daughter a little bit. We went and did, did some desert racing. Uh, yeah down in texas and uh i she she's very athletic she loves sports but um i want to i want to keep her you know out of trouble and out of the stuff the teenage girls and you know the stuff that they deal with these days and yeah. and if sports and racing if i if, if that'll keep her busy then then i'm all for it and uh so i think i'm going to put her in my utv at king of the hammers and i'm going to co-drive with her. that's that's uh that's where the direction that i'm headed right now and I, I can't find the pace to get the UTV to the finish line at KOH. Yeah. So I I can't figure out how to dial it back a little bit and not drive it like my Ultra 4 truck. Sure. So, and, I, and UTVs, there's a little bit more finesse to it. Your tires aren't as big. Your parts aren't as big. You know, they they can't crash into a boulder like like an 800 horsepower Ultra 4 truck. And sure. I can't find the, the right pace to get to the finish line. And I think my daughter has it. Um, I've really enjoyed racing with her and teaching her how to rock crawl. She's been rock crawling with me since she was like a year old. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like that. Um, a lot of my partners really like the story of, you know, let rolling that down to your kids and, and teaching them and keeping them involved with what you're doing and stuff. So um, the, U, the UTV race, I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, I hope I can get to her, her to the finish line. She'd be the first one in, in our family to get there. And uh, oh, cool. I, think she, I think she'd be the youngest one to ever finish as well. So I, I uh, you know, I, I think that would be really neat stuff to, to try to accomplish this year. Um, up in the air on the Everyman Challenge race and then the Desert race, um, we've got some opportunities in both of those. Mm -hmm. So the Desert race being the Saturday before and Sunday before, um, we may have a couple extra Ultra 4 trucks hanging around the shop uh, that time. And... Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out if uh, if we should run those in the desert race. So a bunch yeah. of cool stuff up in the air. Nothing really committed to 100% other than the UTV race mm -hmm. and the 4400 race right now. But um, anyway, it's just, I mean, it's it's going to be awesome. I I'm I feel like it's like 50-50 chance of it happening in February. Sure. Um, Dave told us at Oklahoma, he announced in the driver's summit that he did have a backup date later in the year. If, uh, if things don't work out that he already had permitted with the BLM and stuff like that. So I'm not telling anybody anything that he didn't say out of his mouth at yeah. the driver's summit, but, um, I, I, you know, California locked down a bunch of their cities again yesterday, San Diego, Sacramento. Um, our kids are getting told they're getting taken back out of school and going back to online learning right now. Yeah. I, I feel like the trend with with COVID right now and and everything with the virus and stuff that's going on that that everybody's gonna kind of have to protect themselves through the winter and and it's gonna be really hard to have King of the Hammers in February. I I may be way off base. They have a great strategy in place. Yeah. For COVID testing on site, how to mitigate yeah. the the risk. You know, the BLM's on board with it. So I I, I mean I I hope it does. I hope I hope we're back racing in February. I really do. But. Um, I, I think there's going to be a lot to, to really be decided in the next you know month or so. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's all interesting information. And I hadn't put much thought into the fact of, you know, uh, I, to a certain degree, you know, with the recent news of the vaccine this week, 
uh, you know, that may play into factor, but I hadn't even thought about it really making that big of a deal. You know, uh, a lot of the study is showing if you're outside, it's one thing, you know, if you're inside, it's a different thing, different, you know, uh, risks and things like that. But I'm excited to hear that there's preparation already in place for an alternative date. I think that that's really, that's very good, Heinz, very good uh, foresight on, on Dave's end. So that's great. Uh, but you pretty much answered all my questions in regards to the UTV and the 4400. Uh, one question I had about the UTV and actually together is last year we saw a UTV uh, run in the 4400 class and have, I mean, you know, I think he was able to finish. And what are your thoughts on that? Because it's kind of controversial, but like maybe not, maybe it's something else there. What do you think? I think it's rad. Hunter is a stud. That, the, those Miller boys can absolutely drive. Yeah. Um, they're they're awesome to watch out there. I don't have any problem racing with the racing with them. I mean, as long as it's not some donkey that that is way off the pace that maybe is creating a unsafe situation yeah. where we where we could run over them in the dust or you know something like that and hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. um, that that's really my only concern and is, and you know, he, what he ended up like 12th or 14th or something. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was, I mean, when I say he had considerable success, I mean, that's very, very good. In, in the same machine that won the UTV race, right? Or, I mean, that, right. to, I think it to, was uh, Cody Miller in the 4400 and then Hunter Miller, his brother won the UTV class. But I think Cody was in the mix in there. I have to freshen up mine. Yeah. I'll look. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think I think it's rad. I mean, I'm I don't have any problem with it. Um, somebody needs to get those boys in an Ultra Four truck because they'll probably come out and clean all our clocks. But um, yeah, I mean, I I have no problem with it. I think I think the way the UTVs are evolving and the way the new machines keep coming out, I mean, that they're not that far off of an Ultra Four truck. And really, that they a UTV like you know the new XB Pros are are the closest thing out there to an ultra four truck. It's just, it's a toned down $30,000 ultra four truck that with the similar horsepower to weight ratio that, you know, they, they can do the stuff that we're doing in our ultra four truck. So I, I love seeing it. I love seeing Polaris, you know, push, push the technology and the innovation. And, yeah. You know, if we end up getting to see new machines with more horsepower and bigger tires. I'm, I'm all for it. Like, let's, let's see it. So. So that leads me to believe, uh, you know, well, not leads me to believe, but that leads me to the question of, do you think that we'll see a Polaris machine or the Can-Am, the next leap being over that 1,000 cc mark? I, I mean, I feel like it's got to be coming. I, I feel like we got, well, at some point we've got to see definitely more horsepower. I mean, that's the war, right? We're going to see over 200 horsepower before too long. Yeah. And and are they going to be stock on 35s? Like, is that is that where we're headed? I mean, that is not far from an ultra four truck, in my opinion. No, it's and especially when you look at you know the 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 scale ratio between the cars. I mean, you put a thirty five on there. I would say to scale, that's larger than a forty on on your wheelbase and, and width and things like that. So, I think you're right, and I think we're in a really cool spot. So, I'm I'm a UTV guy uh, by nature, but the big cars are always you know the the star of the show. But I think that we're in this really weird spot where uh, we're going to start seeing these 4,400 spec UTVs being developed. And I know that there was one on the lake bed last year that was an independent guy who made it. And it was, it was a very kind of like a, not a Frankenstein of a machine, but a one-off that was really cool. And I think that that, uh, I think that that'll be the future. Now I don't, I don't have any word from any manufacturer about that or anything, but I'm, I'm excited that uh, it seems like it's being talked about more and more. So that's always good news. It's very affordable racing. I mean, you can go buy one for thirty thousand dollars and and put some safety equipment on it and go race. I mean, it's it's where every time somebody who asks me how to get started racing, that's what I recommend that you go race UTVs and see if it's for you before you go buy a two hundred thousand dollar race truck. Um, I, it's it's the 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 OEM battles right now. Same with like Bronco and Jeep or Raptor and the TRX. Can Am and Polaris are they're battling with each other right now, and they want, they both want to be the best, and and mm -hmm. it's 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 the consumers who win those battles because when they keep throwing it at them, we win every single time. Now you brought up the new Bronco, you know Bronco versus Jeep. We have the new Bronco car that's come out. You've spent a considerable amount of time in it, uh, even taking it through some of the Hammers trails, if I understood correctly. Give me your thoughts on that because the fact that any you know. Uh, 
factory vehicle, if we'll call it that, factory full-size vehicle, was able to make it through any range of those trails is astonishing. Can you tell me a little bit about your experiences with that? Yeah, man, I'm I'm so excited and grateful for the opportunity to be involved with the launch of the new Bronco and to have, have gotten the opportunity to go out and do the durability testing that the engineers and the, and the drivers have been out there doing. Um, Brad Lovell has been heavily involved with that as well. And so we've gotten to go out and spend a, a couple of days of filming content and just, I mean, beating on the Broncos out in Johnson Valley. Yeah. The, the first time I got in one and started running one of their durability loops, they, they uh, you know, I was being respectful. I, I didn't know this, this Ford engineer that was sitting next to me. And I'm driving along at like what I feel like is about 40 or 50%. And, and he's like, all right, Lauren, I, I appreciate you being respectful, but we need to push this vehicle to our durability pace. And yeah. you're running at about 50% of what that is. Wow. And I just, I was mind blown that a stock vehicle could be driven that hard over and over and over again on the, in this durability testing for hours and hours on end. And by the end I was, tired my arms were fatigued and had been running at like a qualifying uh ultra four pace for hours on end in these broncos yeah and I got out and my mind was just absolutely blown i could not believe that that it was that these vehicles could take it yeah how good maneuverable and smooth that they were and and that you know that they were just designed ford ford did so much homework going into the bronco and took their time coming out. I know everybody's been waiting for 20 years, but yeah. <laughs> it, it's an amazing vehicle. I'm so excited. There's so many cool technological things that are that are just awesome. Um, the, the front camera system to somebody who's been off-roading for 20 years, and I'm like, yeah, that's a gimmick. After 20 minutes of run, wheeling in the rocks, I was staring at the front camera the whole time instead of looking at the rocks out the picture. Wow. Like, it, there's really cool stuff. That, that's coming with the new Bronco. The, the turn assist stuff's really neat. The trail modes that come with it. Uh, the, the, and, and a lot of people are concerned with the, with the IFS, but you know, side-by-sides are IFS. Yeah. I would never build a solid axle ultra four truck ever again. They drive like tractors. It, <laughs> I completely understand you know, why Ford is built it out of IFS. In all situations besides, you know, maybe going up sledgehammer. Yeah. IFS is a better option. It, it performs better. You you have better steering. You have there's everything about it performs better in ninety nine percent of applications. So yeah. they Ford killed it on this. I'm so excited to have gotten the opportunity to be in the you know the, the pre release stuff and I can't wait for the general cameras to to get into them. Yeah, me too, because I, I started in Jeeps and I think it's really cool to have a direct competitor to that. Uh, and it's something that's not necessarily the exact same. It's something that's, I mean, in my opinion, way higher end of the vehicle. Uh, and it's got, like you mentioned, IFS. It's just like the different flavor, but it really seems like you're getting a lot more technology in that car than you would say compared to the Rubicon edition of, you know, a Ford or Jeep JL or whatever it may be, which all in all, you know, I think that I saw a couple of videos of you wheeling a JL a couple of years ago or what have you. They're great cars, but I really think that Bronco has got a really neat thing with the technology that they've implemented. For sure. And, and like the stuff that like, my my ranger we there's you know it's not a just random surprise that we built that ranger right we knew that that bronco was going to be on a similar platform to the ranger and that's why we wanted to go start learning about it and, and we built that ranger to do everything to be able to pre-run you know and i'm taking it down to mexico to go pre-run a thousand miles in the desert with it i would never want to do that in jeep yeah. um it it getting to the trail being part of the adventure you know, getting you out into nature is what, what the Bronco is really going to excel at. And, and I, I think everybody's going to be pleasantly surprised. And, you know, it took some work to put some 40s on, on that Ranger, but, you know, people are going to be able to modify them and make them their own and customize them just like they do with Jeeps. And it, it's exciting. The, the, I think Jeep uh, is, is on notice right now and, and they know Ford's Great. coming for their market. I, I would have to agree with you uh, because they're trying to drop little hints and teasers and new things everywhere. And, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of grasping for the uh, the attention back. So I agree with you. Uh, yeah. I want to talk about that Ranger, too, before we doze off the subject. Uh, 
that little ranger can climb some wild stuff. I've seen you at Choke Cherry, uh, it's Choke Cherry Canyon, right? Yep. I have seen videos of you. I think you put one up just a day or two ago of you running up an obstacle at night. Dude, that's bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. First off, that truck looks ginormous. And then when you really put it back in scale, it's like, wow, this is not the, you know, this isn't some extended cab, giant wide vehicle. This is a super nimble little car. Uh, tell me about that. And what, Cause I know you've made some upgrades to it, but that car can climb a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, the whole point of Vaughn and I building that truck was, was to learn about Bronco. We wanted to know what we were going to, what we were going to do for upgrades and, and that type of stuff. So, um, I mean, we wanted ultra four inspired suspension underneath there. So we, we called Kibby tech who has done builds for Vaughn before very well known in the desert industry and told them the goals with the truck. And that we, you know, we wanted to put spider tracks, uh, you know, 10 inch third members in this thing and, and wanted to yeah. use RCB series 30 CVs and axle shafts, just like we do on our race trucks. And, and, you know, it's, it's so overkill. That thing's built to handle a thousand horsepower and, and, you know, same thing, same thing that our race trucks, you know, can handle. But um, we, we wanted to know how to go all out on this thing and, and really exceeded my expectations. So when we built it, we initially had it on 37s. Um, we wanted to test the electric rack. So we left the electric rack in there stock for a while, never had a single problem with it, um, but wanted to upgrade to forties. And so then we put a, a PSC steering box on it with a swing set and added a hydraulic pump, um, you know, to, to help turn those forties a little bit better. Yeah. But um, I mean, I never really thought that that Ranger, I figured we could go run Hell's Revenge or something like that in it. Yeah. I never thought I would be climbing all the gnarliest, trails out there same as as any of the very very well built jeeps on you know 40s or 42s yeah. do yeah. it has exceeded my expectations i mean i i i still cannot believe it came out of, i drove out of devil's hot tub on on hell's revenge i that that to me is is the biggest you know exceeding expectations that that truck's done yet it it was it was wild when i drove that thing out of there yeah absolutely and and I think that the fun haver as a, as like a whole, you guys are doing some really neat stuff. I think that I, I like tip my hat to you because not only is it cool content coming out, but like you guys are doing unique things, things that you don't always see all the time. You're not, you're not just building another Jeep. You're not just building another trail buggy. There's all these unique spins and, and you know, tags to all of it. So uh, you guys are doing great. Keep it up. Uh, that was pretty much all I had for the interview. The last thing to ask you is for the future. Um, if there's anything you have on the, on, in your mind for the future or on where you're going to be, obviously King of Hammers, but, uh, or King of the Hammers, excuse me. Um, but where are you going to be and where people can come see you and where they can follow you? Yes. I mean, social media, Instagram and Facebook are definitely the best places to find me. Uh, we have launched a fun haver YouTube channel, um, that's just starting to get off the ground. We just started creating content, putting that stuff up there. Um, so you can, you can check out that or, uh, just my name, Lauren Healy, uh, on Instagram or on Facebook is, is definitely a great place to go, uh, see all the shenanigans that, that we get into. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, anything else you want to say before we close it out at an hour and almost 40 minutes? <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Once I get to rambling, it's it's sometimes uh, get a little excited. But no, thank you so much. I mean, like I said, I I listen to some of your podcasts when I've been driving, you know, to races and to marketing yeah. events and stuff. And I really, I really did enjoy, you know, some of the stuff you had to talk talk to and and talk about. And I think you have a great fan base and and uh, excited to be a part of it. And I look forward to seeing all the other uh, podcasts you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. We'll stay on the line for me. What we'll do is we'll close this bad boy out. Everybody, thanks for listening. We appreciate it.